Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce one of America's greatest global advocates, thought leaders, and caregivers, but most importantly, one of my dear friends, Mara Gordon. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Whoa, that is not the beginning of my slides. There it is, here we go. I didn't remember I did your slide cover. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Laura and Fernando for organizing such a beautiful event and including me this time. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it to Porto this year, but next year I'm gonna plan a lot better because I wanna see a lot more of this beautiful country. So I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about uh, dosing and a little bit about how to get started and a little bit about why it matters and why it doesn't matter at the same time. How you can use cannabis and use it right or use it wrong and they're both gonna be right. Okay, so the first thing is, when if we look at a short history of medicine, and we go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, there have been forms of medicine long before we had a single tablet from Bayer, from willow bark of aspirin. At, there'd been medicine around forever and ever, and it started out, somebody comes and they say, okay, their ear is hurting them. They go to the medicine man, they go to the witch doctor, and they say, okay, I have an earache. And they say, okay, here, eat this root. And they gave you a plant to eat. And then that root is heathen as we got, became more sophisticated and more educated, and we say, okay, say a prayer, because all of a sudden the invisible spirits are gonna solve your hearing, your, your earache. And then that's superstition, so drink this. And then it was like, that is a snake oil, so take this pill. And that's where we've gotten to so far in the 20th century, was taking a pill for everything, all right? And then we say, okay, that pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic. And then the bugs have won. Now we have super strains of, of bugs that the antibiotics don't work for. You have to have, now we're getting back to this, okay? It doesn't work, let's go ahead and eat a root and go back to plant medicine. And that's where we are now with cannabis, is we're back to talking about and dealing with whole plant medicines. All right? So back in, I think it was 2017, there was a very comprehensive study done of all of the different papers that have been out there and all the studies that have been out, done out there on cannabis and its uh, effects and its benefits. Some of the claims that are made by people are crazy of what it can do. But on the other hand, this study was very, very narrow. Because yes, you go back to the, uh, the multiple of anecdotal isn't evidence, but on the other hand, you have tens of thousands of people around the world that are doing something. It may be anecdotal, but nobody's getting hurt, or people aren't getting hurt, people aren't dying from it, so why not go ahead and take these chances in the meantime? Cannabis, on the other hand, is not a panacea. It does not work for everything. Um, I'm getting ready to have cervical spinal surgery. Cannabis is gonna be incredibly effective in the pain management, in the, as a neuroprotectant, and all of those things, but I still have to have the surgery. It doesn't, it doesn't solve, it's, your arm gets cut off, it doesn't grow another arm. If you listen to some of the activists out there, you would think that cannabis could solve every one of the Earth's problems, and it's just not the case. So right here you have, uh, this is, not working for me, that's okay. The, oh, here we go. These, this list here are the medical, medical conditions. There's a really wonderful website called projectcbd.org. It was started by uh, Martin Lee a number of years ago. And it, uh, he, he, he stresses that he doesn't think that CBD is the answer to everything. It just is the name of his, his project. And these were some of the conditions that we have found evidence to be effectiveness for the use of cannabis in treating different diseases. Now, all, as Dr. Sanchez said earlier, all uh, cannabinoids, this is the mother compound, CBGA, all right? And as the plant uh, uh, continues through its genetic life cycle as it's growing, it will convert based upon the genetics of the plant into some of the other uh, multiple uh, cannabinoids in the raw form. As it's heated, it goes and becomes like the CBGA becomes CBG. THCA, which is the raw, which is a lot of times used very effectively in conjunction with other treatments for 
uh, epilepsy, autism, Crohn's disease, um, uh, as an adjunct for cancers. It's very good. We, we recommend often to using CB, uh, THCA when people have gut issues. Um, and oftentimes, especially with autism disorder, you'll see a lot of times there's gut issues as well. And so it can be very soothing with that and also as a fun to it with the brain. Um, and then as it continues to, you, it, it's now gone into its heated or activated state, the decarboxyl molecule has been removed through heating. And at that point, you then have your active compounds like THC and CBD, which were the most commonly known. And then, of course, THCV with the virin that's very interesting and very exciting for doing some studies in, uh, for diabetes and some other illnesses as well. Um, um, particularly in diabetes, it's of interest because of its work on the insulin um, uh, uh, production so that it seems to be able to allow people to reduce uh, in some cases. We obviously need to do clinical trials, and you're going to keep hearing that over the next two days over and over and over again, is we need more trials, we need to do more studies. Absolutely 100%. But there's not a reason in the world not to move forward doing some of these things because there is no such thing at this point that we're aware of of any kind of an overdose, especially if you're using a whole plant. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So, and then when it goes through an aged process, and after that's been old, like I, I've had people say, oh, I found a bag of weed in my back of my closet that's been sitting there for two years, and now it acts very differently than it used to. Where it used to be I could use it and be energized, now I use it and it makes me sleepy. Well, what's happened is that THC that you have here has degraded to CBN. And CBN also activates the cannabinoid uh, receptor but it also has a more of a somnolent effect. And one of the beautiful things about cannabis is if you'll notice these lists under here, and these are, this is in no way complete, but it's just some examples. Th no matter if you use it in its raw form, its heated form, or its aged form, you still are going to have medical benefits from this plant. It's the gift that just keeps on giving no matter what form it's in. It's just beautiful that way. And I just listed a few of him here. There's over 100 more that have been identified at this point. When I first started um, um, my studies into cannabis, what I first saw was there was like 80 cannabinoids that had been identified, and now we're up over 144. And then we have, of course, the terpenes. There's flavonoids, terpenoids, all sorts of other compounds within the plant itself. Many of them, uh, I believe somebody asked a question about mangoes earlier, if I heard correctly. Uh, they were talking about the myrcene that's in that, and so it's kind of an old hippie trick that they used to do where they would eat a mango before they smoked uh, a joint, and they've said that it increased the bioavailability. There is no scientific evidence, as uh, Christina said. However, if, if that's what people think, who knows? I mean, I'm not, I don't know enough to know. I just know that it does m the, the terpenes very uh, greatly modulate the effect of the cannabinoids, so that they affect very deeply how you're going to feel. Myrcene is one of the ones that we use a lot in the sleep formulations. Um, we want it to be there. It has a lot of really wonderful anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic, anti-psychotic, I mean, all sorts of things. Limonene, you find in the peel of uh, lemon. And um, I like to tell a story that uh, one time I was on an airplane and I was in a really bad mood. I mean, anyone been around me in a bad mood, you know that's not a good place to be. But I was in a really bad mood. And um, I had a man sitting next to me who was quite large and in my side of the seat. And I'm having to sit like this. And I'm really not happy. And the flight attendant came around with the wet washcloths. And it had been, had lemon. It had been soaked in hot lemon water. And when I put it to my face, my entire energy just was like, Phew. I just felt better, I felt calm, I felt, I felt invigorated at the same time, and it really completely shifted how I felt, and that was 100% the limonene, certainly not just having a wet washcloth on my face. Because I tried it on the way here, uh, around the way to uh, Munich they gave me, and it was wet washcloth, there was no lemon in it, and it didn't make me any calmer, I was still mean the whole trip. So, so caryophylline, 
Caryophylline is one of the really interesting and important uh, terpenes that we find in cannabis because it is, uh, it is pr most primarily found in something called Ashanti black pepper and white pepper, which is out of a region in Africa. However, in pepper in general, um, and, and it uh, is the only, I think it might be the only one, but it's one in particular that also activates the CB2 receptor as a terpene and not as a cannabinoid. So it's very interesting to have that. And we find that when we decarboxylate uh, and we heat the, our medicine when we're making it and our preparations, there will always be, it's very sturdy, and there will be a strong level of, of beta-caryophylline within the medicine itself. Um, linalool, linalool is found in uh, lavender. It's very calming. You go for a massage. Oftentimes, they'll have the pillow uh, scented or they'll have a air uh, essential oil in there with lavender because it's very calming. Also very good in sleep formulations as well. And then the pinene group, which of course is found f from pine, this has a, a lot of promise for research is around alpha pinene. Um, on the other hand, a little bit goes a long way. For some people, if they have uh, a varietal or a cultivar that they are using that has high levels of pinene, it can make them very anxious. It's also one, on the other hand, that's used very well for people with ACD, AC, ADHD, OCD, PTSD, because it can be very focusing as well. But not a little bit goes a long way on the pinenes. With this, there's over 400 more. When I started, there were 200. Now they're closer to 400 or over 400 that have been identified. So anybody that thinks we know everything about cannabis, we know what we know, but we don't know yet what we don't know. So when we look at any study that, that, that lists 10 or 20 or 30 cannabinoids and 30 or 40 or 50 terpenes, just know that we don't know yet what's being left out. We still don't know. We don't know what that key log might be that might be the one that holds it all together. So I'm going to talk to you about chocolate cake, okay? <laughs> Janos loves this one. Okay, so I tried to explain to somebody one time about the entourage effect and why it matters and why the medicines where they've been prepared in such a way where they isolate out or the pure compounds of the cannabinoids and then they put them together with a few terpenes and they put it together, why that doesn't give you the same effect as the whole plant when it's in its uh, natural form. So everything you see here in front of you are the ingredients that are used to make a chocolate cake. You've got your flour and butter and sugar and eggs and vanilla and, and all the things that you need. And you can eat those things one by one by one and you're going to have had the calories of eating a chocolate cake and things like that, but the thing you're not going to have is the experience of eating a chocolate cake. You're but you are not going to have your senses be satisfied in the way that they're going to be. You are not going to enjoy it in the same way, and you're not going to want to have that piece of chocolate cake the way you would this versus having it in each one individual ingredient. So I'm going to take this a little bit further and show from the opposite direction. Sugar is more addictive than cocaine, okay? How many people here have a sugar addiction? And my hand's up because I am. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. But you're not addicted. Okay, here's like a bunch of other names that sugar goes by. So when you're reading the ingredients, it's not going to just necessarily just say sugar. So you need to learn what the other words are for sugar as well. But when you're addicted to sugar, this isn't what you want. You don't go and go, oh, I'm going to eat sugar. You want this, right? Okay. So I'm going to see how many people would rather have this or this. Exactly. Exactly. Me too. In fact, I want that little lemon bar right there. <laughs> I missed the break, <laughs> so I'm going to go for that. So talking about synergy and talking about the whole being greater than the sum of its parts, you know, Aristotle said this many, many, many centuries ago. And is the entourage effect is when you mix all these things together and the effect that it has on the body is so greatly different than it is when you have just the single compounds on their own and the way that they feel. And what works in, in rats that ha don't have a choice, they, take, they have whatever the researcher gives them versus a human, is, signif is of significant benefit and importance here. 
all right? People say, why do we need to have all this? Why do we have to have whole plant? We already have durabinol. We already have marinol is out there for the THC. Well, the, think about it. Every drug that's been created, there's a street market for it. You can buy it on a street corner, or you can find a place to buy it. There's nobody out there selling durabinol on a street corner because there is no market because it's such an unpleasant experience. Yes, it may be better in some instances than uh, some of the other options that are out there, but there's no reason to use it when you have the option of using whole plant. The combination of the over 400 cannabinoids and the over 100 uh, excuse me, under, over 100 cannabinoids and 400 terpenes. Think about the number, the simple number of combinations that you can have of the amount of different products you can have that really gives you a full pharmacy and a flower if you know what's in it. It's all about lab testing it to identify what the different compounds that are within that flower are so that you know exactly what it is that you could be using for treating. So I like to talk about this one and I'm, and I'm really excited to see someone who just walked in to, uh, before I got to this slide. So I want to talk about compliance because one of the biggest challenges for the medical community that they've told me is getting their patients to consistently and continuously use the medicines that they want them to use. They might prescribe something to them, but if it's really uncomfortable or difficult to do or too challenging, they're not going to comply. They'll do it one or two times or, or occasionally, but they're not going to comply with it. So what I've identified is the most important for compliance with, with medicine is, first of all, comfort. It's very important that when you create a protocol for a patient using any kind of medicine, but in particular using cannabis medicines, that you titrate them in such a way and that you give them a profile of medicine that they're going to be comfortable with. They're not going to feel so greatly altered that they're unable to function. Um, I had a talk on the break with a gentleman here who's, who was sharing with me some information about his son and the amount of, of, of THC and CBD that this child was taking, if you were to go from nothing to taking that right away or you didn't have a need for it or you were too old to be using that dose, you're going to be miserably uncomfortable. But because it was the appropriate dose for him, he was very comfortable and he was about to go out and, and conduct his life very successfully and have a full life while still using cannabis. So you have to make sure that they're comfortable. You also, it's important that we get the cost down. Right now, when I look at what the cost is of Epidiolex, I don't understand it because I know how cheap it is to actually uh, make you know, a, a compound with CBD. I can tell you exactly what it costs per milligram to actually make it. Um, and so it's a little bit uh, baffling to me why the price would be quite so high. But it has to be without, especially without insurance covering it. If the government uh, run medical programs aren't going to cover it and people's private insurance doesn't cover it, then we have a responsibility to keep all costs down on medicine for compliance. Uh, in 2016, they passed in California the, uh, something called Prop 64, where now they introduced recreational and they put in all these layers of regulation over the work that we've been doing for many years. I met with a patient of ours that we had been working with for about five or six years now, a breast cancer patient, and she didn't look so great. And I was like, what's going on? Because she's been no evidence of disease for many years. It's, she's been a huge success story. And she said... I just can't afford the medicine anymore, so I had to cut my dose in half. Well, her dose is her dose. Her dose is what she needs because the dose isn't something that we got out of a book. It was what we figured out was her therapeutic dose. But because the cost was now prohibitive, she's not able to comply. So that doesn't work. We have to make sure we do things to keep the cost reasonable. And then consistency. We have, a certain, uh, we have a certain tolerance for variable within our medicines and within things in our life. Like you can have a profile of cannabis. Let's say you have a cultivar, and I hate the naming on them. I think that they're silly. But let's say you're using one like Sour Diesel, which is a pretty well standardized, or ACDC on the CBD side. You can get it within a pretty, ac a pretty close range, no matter if you grow it the same con sorts of conditions and you start out with the same genetics. So you're going to have a consistent product. 
what's happening in a lot of places, though, around the world, not just in California, is people don't know what they're getting. So one time it makes them feel wide awake, one time it makes them sleepy, one time they don't feel it at all, one time it's too much, because there's no consistency. And we know we have to have all these three things in order to get people to comply in with taking their medicine. So I'm just going to skip over now to an example of treating a particular condition. And I chose for, for this uh, uh, to show, talk to you about insomnia. Insomnia, especially in the aging population, is one of the most dangerous triggers for poor health outcomes moving forward because uh, uh, sleep uh, issues have been, have been commonly related to everything from dementia, cancer, uh, Alzheimer, uh, cancer, uh, dementia, I already said it, um, high blood pressure. I mean, all the things that are up here on here, are these aren't coming out of my imagination. These are coming from really good sources talking about the things that happened if you don't get enough sleep. And as an elderly person now, myself, when I have uh, poor sleep, I have far increased pain, I have more stress, which help keeps me from sleeping. So it becomes a vicious cycle of not being able to get out of that to actually have uh, a productive life and, and better health. So when you're looking for a sleep formulation, you're going to want to look for some of these types of cannabinoids and terpenes that we have found that can be beneficial and when you're uh, trying to get to sleep and you're looking for a medication or you're making a medication, all right? You do have to be a little bit careful with limonene and pinene because you need to check first to see how they affect you because they may, you may be one of the people that it makes feel very activated or you may be one of the people that it makes it feel very calm. Somebody with PTSD, they use something high in alpha pinene, it may make them just feel like, <sighs> Like I can, I can center, I can relax. If it's you or somebody like me, I use something high in alpha pinene. I feel like I'm jumping out of my skin. It makes me feel jittery and way, way too awake. So I wouldn't use that. But I also want to encourage you to not forget the raw cannabinoids because they also can be potentially of benefit for you as well when you're um, uh, coming up with a sleep formulation. So I'd, I've talked quite a bit now about a dose, but what is a dose? A, do, a dose is how much you take and how often you take it, okay? It's, that's as simple as it is. And then a therapeutic dose is how much is required. How much do I have to take of this to achieve my objective? If my objective is to go to sleep, sleep for eight hours, and wake up feeling refreshed, the amount that I need to use in order to achieve that is a therapeutic dose. If my goal is to get out of pain and still continue on being a high-functioning uh, individual, then it's the amount that I need to get out of pain and, and continue to function. It's not the amount that I get to where I can't get up off the sofa because I'm so stoned. That's not a therapeutic dose. That is either overdose or recreational. But you know, either of those are a therapeutic dose. And then, of course, microdose has gotten a lot of, of noise lately. I don't have a lot of information on it. I'm not a big fan of it. I, don't, I think a lot of that probably has more to do with placebo than the actual uh, health benefits. But as an engineer and not a, a researcher or a doctor, I'm not, I'm not in a position to say one way or the other. Um, some people swear by it, but it's the amount that you don't feel it, but supposedly your body um, has some benefit from it. So I want to talk about what's not a dose. A, a do a not a dose is not a ratio. It's not a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-five, a one-to-twenty, none of that. Those are not a dose. That's just telling you a relationship between components within the medicine itself. Also, the number of drops. You know, I'll ask somebody, How what's your dose? How much are you taking? And they'll say, I'm taking six drops. Six drops of what? They have no idea. Well, then how am I supposed to know? I don't, I don't, I, didn't, I don't even know what medicine you're using. You're just telling me there's six drops. Is it six, what's the concentration of it? In milligrams per milliliter, it's not as big of a problem in, in Europe where you guys have the metric system, but in the United States, getting people to understand that one's a weight and one's a volume is very, very difficult. Um, because I'll say to somebody, how much are you taking? And they'll say, I'm taking 30 milliliters. And I'm like, whoa, really? That's a lot, you know? And it turns out they're talking milligrams. Um, but what's important also, and so for the medical community, it's easy for us to 
tell our patients to take three drops. But it's also important that we say to them, and in those three drops, you will be getting nine milligrams of THC or CBD, so that they, we can start educating them to start thinking it in terms of the volume of the medicine itself and the weight of the molecules and not just the number of drops. Otherwise, they're not empowered to go to the next product and know how to take it because they don't know what they were taking of the other. And if they're not the exactly the same concentration, then they're not going to have any idea how to take the product itself. So here's an example. And like I say, it's everybody is different. But we have found in our research so far that 15 milligrams is about average that what we're finding for treating insomnia. All right. Now, this is a somewhere probably people in their 40s. This isn't people in their 70s. All right. So just keep in mind that everything you want to start at like a third of a milligram or one milligram and increase accordingly. But this is about on average what we're doing. And right now, um, one of my uh, groups uh, is we're doing uh, clinical trials. We're in phase two right now on insomnia. Um, using various doses. By by. And this is actually a dominant THC. And these would be the types of terpenes you'd want to be looking for in it. And it's to be taken uh, sublingually before bedtime. So how does the, the patient take this and turn that into a medicine and know how to then take that medicine and then how to use it? So if you're making a medical recommendation or you're making a recommendation to a patient and you don't know what product they're going to end up using specifically to achieve that, we have to empower the patient to know how to read the label to understand then what they need to take. Otherwise, it's just like, that's great. Now what do I do? I don't know what to do next. So I've taken that and I've increased, put it here. That's the dose, the bedtime. And then that label right there, I'm going to go ahead and show you in a bigger form. That's basically all it says right there, OK? And it's saying that there are, there's 10 milligrams of THC per milliliter of, uh, of liquid. And this happens to be an infused olive oil. There are 300 milligrams in the whole bottle. And so there's 30 milligrams in there. All right. So in this case, since it's 10 milligrams per milliliter, and we want the person to take 15 milligrams, Pretty simple math. It's 1.5 milliliters or one and a half droppers. And, the, and, the, and you should always try to get a medicine where the droppers are marked accurately so that you know how to actually use them in case, case you don't have. Because it's like it's one of those things where you, if you're off a little bit, you can be off quite a bit in what your dosing consistency is. And so just remember that that's, it's a very simple way to read the label. So um, how's the translator doing so far, by the way, on time? I mean, on my pace. Going well? Perfect. OK. So how to titrate for sleep. I always say you should begin extremely low, like with one milligram at the most, and sometimes a third of a milligram. In this particular formulation, at 10 milligrams per milliliter, it's going to be approximately a third of a milligram per drop. So you're going to want to stop, depending on your level of, of sophistication with cannabis. If you're cannabis naive, you're always going to want to start somebody extremely low to see what their reaction is or what your own reaction if you're self-medicating. Um, and only after you have identified, it's kind of like if you color your hair, they always tell you to do a skin patch test first to see if you're going to have a reaction. It's the same idea. It's let's, let's see where you are so we know how quickly we can uh, escalate your, or titrate you up to a therapeutic dose. And in this case, it's right. and then uh, wait a couple of nights. The worst outcome that can happen as you take a little bit, you, you're cannabis naive, you take just a small amount, you wait two hours, three hours, and you go, oh, well, this didn't work, so I'm going to take some more. Well, let's say you're a, a slow metabolizer, and then it all hits, and all of a sudden, you've taken too much, and then you're going to have a very uncomfortable experience. And what the unfortunate outcome is, is people will say, oh, I tried cannabis, and it didn't work for me. Well, you didn't try cannabis. You tried you tried one t form of it, one amount of it, and everything else. So what I say is if you have insomnia, chances are you've had this a long time. You can go one more night. Don't, don't, don't mess it up by trying that night to fix it. The next night, take two or three drops. Take or two or three more. And keep going up until you find the amount 
that is right for you to give you that therapeutic dose of eight hours of sleep, waking up feeling refreshed in the morning. Okay, remember, start slowly, increase very, very slowly. Everyone is different. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and mention here in the data that I've been collecting for all these years now, one of the things that we have found uh, is that there is um, uh, more of a correlation between the age of the patient and the dose than there is between the weight of the patient. For example, I can have a... Um, I don't know kilos very well, but I can, if I'm talking about a 200-pound man, what's that going to be? Pardon? Yeah, okay. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's, it's going to be a gross, huge person. Might use 10% of what a very slender woman can, would use. So there isn't as much of a correlation between that. I've been surprised sometimes at how much some small people will use and how little it takes for some big people. Um, but we also find, though, that children tend to use a much, much higher dose to achieve results than older people do. Um, I, I tracked a bunch of the data across our glioblastoma patients over a number of years, and I had the children on an average of 300 milligrams of both THC and CBD a day, and the older, they were more like 70 milligrams to achieve the same results. So you can actually look through and see that as the older, you're not going to try to give an older person the same type of starting dosing uh, therapeutic recommendations as you would for younger people. And everyone is different because just because the person sitting next to you uses a particular product and a particular dose doesn't mean that that's going to work for you. So you need to actually personally do this to find out what's going to work best. And always increase very slowly because it's better to take more as you need it for the next time and then instead of take, taking too much and then having a negative experience. Um, so I was just showing the bottle. So let's look at the different types that are out there, the different types of products. So this is um, a pure compound isolate. Uh, this is the only FDA, I guess I, I didn't really have to cover it. Everybody knows Epidiolex at this point, um, right? But I was trying to be brand neutral here. Um, but it, when it was a, an N of one, it's kind of hard to. But um, uh, it, it, you know, it's a particular approach to this. Uh, is it the best approach? Um, I don't necessarily think so. Uh, nano encapsulated, there's a lot of buzz around nano encapsulation now because what this is, is, is it's basically using an emulsifier that allows the cannabinoids to be blended and suspended and also have a much uh, faster uptake. There's great uses and great recommendations for these types of products if they're done well with safe like with they're using safe emulsifiers and liposomals. So what they are is like, for example, let's say it's 10 o'clock at night and you need to go to sleep. And you forgot to take your medicine. And it, you, you're a slow metabolizer, and it's going to take you an hour and a half before it works. But you need to go to bed now. You can use something with, with a nano encapsulation. And within 15 minutes, you're going to have the effect you're going for. The downside is, in an hour and a half, it's going to be gone. So you're going to still need to take your longer-acting, longer-term medicine along with it so that as it wears off, the other one takes effect and keeps you asleep through the night. So there are different strategies for using products like that. But now you can buy everything from CBD-infused waters, all these things, and I would recommend that you keep your money in your pocket on a lot of them because, you know, five milligrams of CBD in a bottle like this if, it's, if you're getting any kind of health benefit, it's, it's probably more in your head than in your, uh, than in your cells. CO2 mixed in oil. This is another one that's very common out there, or CO2 in, in all kinds of forms. Um, there was a big move a number of years ago where, you know, unless you were doing big CO2 extraction, you weren't, you weren't going to be able to scale. Everybody was talking about building their businesses and scaling, and that's just not true. There's all sorts of scales. But CO2 is a, uh, a way to very quickly have a consistent product um, that is um, that I would consider not to be of um, um, as uh, beneficial as it would for other forms because you're basically destroying the the plant. You're using very very high pressure 
to push it through and it separates out the THC and the CBD and all the cannabinoids and terpenes and then what's left gets put back together in many cases. Also what happens is oftentimes they take those terpenes and they sell them off separately or they use those in, uh, to make shatter and things like that for people to do dabs and they don't even put them back in the oil or they use artificial terpenes and put back in or whatever. So you want to make sure that you know your product very, very well and that you understand how it was made uh, when you get it. Not, not all CO2 is made alike. Uh, I have seen recently in some uh, extraction processes that are getting a little bit more promising, but you still, you can go on YouTube and you can look at, there's an example of, of somebody uh, shooting a potato out of a gun, of a, like a cannon at 800 PSI, which is on the lower side of, of, the, of, the, extract of the pressure for uh, subcritical. And it puts a hole through a tree Okay, so this is what you're doing to this plant when you put it through a CO2 process. And then there's infused directly into, from the plant, directly into uh, oil. Uh, this is something that I recommend um, as being something that's very simple to do. It's so simple, it's as old as time, just soaking it and having the cannabinoids infused. You're not going to have your high, high concentrations, but it's going to be beneficial, it's going to be enough for most. Um, you can also obviously adjust it with things by adding extracts and things to standardize the amounts. Uh, but uh, I, I've been a big fan of, of infused that way for years. And there's all kinds of different product types for doing it yourself at home, which I think is very important that people understand that in not everywhere where everybody lives do they have the opportunity to be exposed to the kind of products that you know, that I know that I'm fortunate enough in, in California and in the United States and like in Canada. I mean, we don't, we ha we're, we're living in, you know, very, very promising times where we are, but we're the exception, not the rule. So oftentimes people are making it themselves. Um, that's how I started. I started right there in my kitchen with what I call my magic pan. Uh, a lot of years ago, I have not made it in my kitchen in a long time, though I'm, I was running out of topical recently and I was like, you know, I don't have time to get to the lab, maybe I'll just make some for fun. But um, uh, a lot of people started that way. Product types, you have your extracts into concentrates, obviously, uh, making it so that you have, you can do it yourself at home. This is a device that uh, um, I came across recently and tried out and was it perfect? No, but it was so much better than people doing it with butane and uh, rice cookers and all sorts of things, making it at home. At least it was safer using ethanol for extraction. And then all the different methods of ingestion. Um, so, th oh gosh, there's so many products now. I mean, th there's actually a website that's being this, that's out there right now where people are posting all the different types of products. The latest craze right now is CBD infused athletic wear. All right? Not really sure. I just saw a bra, an athletic bra, and it said it's good for 40 washings. I mean, <laughs> really? I mean, what are you treating with your, with your running clothes? And then there's people in their shampoos and all sorts of products. I mean, it's crazy. But we're going to talk about like the way people are using it medically, not people are using it to jump on a fad bandwagon. And of course, people have been smoking flour for as long as I think people have been using cannabis in one way. I mean, I think it started initially as all as topical poultices and things like that back, you know, thousands of years ago. You can vaporize flour extracts. There's been a lot of noise out there um, because of the people that have been having lung disease and, and dying from uh, vaporization. I think it's important to keep in mind that not a single one of those products came from a regulated licensed market. What was happening is people were getting things that have pesticides in them and heavy metals and all sorts of other chemical compounds. They're also being mixed in with compounds that they're not designed to be inhaled into the lungs, like MCT and propylene glycol. These are all things that are, should not be taken into the lungs. But because they aren't regulated, people are doing it and nobody's stopping them. Uh, in California, largest single uh, market in the world, we have uh, 
three to one ratio of illegal operations to legal. So y yes, it is more expensive, but you want to make sure that you're getting the things that have been tested and that, not have, that haven't been rejected from a regulated market. Um, Juicing the raw leaves or infusions, these are all fantastic ways to use it as well. I, I personally think that sublingual, because you have the best predictability when you go through the mucosal directly into the bloodstream, you're going to have a higher and more consistent bioavailability. When you eat like a brownie or something like that, you're going to be dealing with things like um, how tired are you? How hydrated are you? Have you um, ha had anything to eat today? There's all sorts of other compounding effects that can impact how that actually is going to affect so that it's not going to be consistent. And one of the biggest complaints that we get from people who use edibles um, is the inconsistency. And if you go back what I was talking about before, consistency is one of the very, very important parts of this. Topical, topical is the greatest form of entry for cannabis. You can go to your grandmother and she's going to say, oh, I'm not going to use that. I don't want to get high or whatever. But if you show her that she can take her arthritis or that she can take, she burned herself, you know, making you something and you, you can put some topical on it and she has relief, that's the easiest way to relieve some of these barriers to entry for the population because the aging population is the one that truly is the most vulnerable right now to the pharmaceutical industry and can benefit the most from having um, access to high quality cannabis products. Um, and then I want to talk for just a minute if I could about uh, suppositories and that would be rectal and vaginal as well. Um, if you have back then, you also need to have some sort of a liposomal, something to make it get to um, have uptake through the rectum because it's a one-way valve. It's not so that when people say, yeah, you know, I was able to use, you know, take a gram of, of, of extract or a thousand milligrams of THC and use it rectally and I didn't get high, isn't that great? And I'm like, well, if you didn't get high, did you activate your CB1 receptors? Because as far as I know, if you're not feeling it, if you're not activating your receptors, a thousand milligrams is just money thrown this way and then go back out that way. So keep that in mind. And then also the biphasic, which you're using, which you're using uh, uh, at a low dose, let's say like, for example, I, I use cannabis for nausea, all right? But if I take, and I use THC, I'm going to stand here up right now and just Full on, I am not, I mean, CBD is great, and I know a lot of people get a lot of benefit for it. I'm team THC all the way. So I use it for nausea, and it's fantastic, but if I use a little bit too much, it makes me nauseous. And if I, and I use cannabis for sleep, but if I use too much, it makes my brain too active, and then I can't get to sleep. And so if you think about it, what, it, what it's, you're treating, you can end up causing it more so, all right? Um, I don't believe any of the research or any of the things that I've said that say that it can cause more tumor growth or things like that, but it may potentially be charging, creating more seizures. We don't know. I don't know. I don't have enough data on it at this point, but you want to be careful on that. Okay. All right. And that's it. Thank you very much. Done? Uh, yeah. Oh, we have one question. One question, one question, okay. Yes. On the app. So it's in Portuguese, so I will translate. Thank you. In a young lady of, uh, in a young lady of 17 years old with panic attacks and anxiety, which most of the time occurs during the night, what should be the best percentage of CBD and THC? <sighs> okay. Um, this is a lesson I learned from Dr. Donald Abrams, and that is not treating from the stage. So, um, I, and also I don't feel qualified to answer that without a whole lot of more information. So whoever that individual is, if you would like to talk to me on the next break, I am happy to see if I can do to help you to get started. Maybe the right? person can raise the hand. It's so right over there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you.